Let's think about OSPF neighbors again. As we've seen, there is a network between neighbors. This could be a very small network, only enough to connect two routers together and nothing more. Or it could be a bigger network. There could be several routers connecting to a switch. There might even be other devices on the same switch. From OSPF's perspectives, that's only two of the possible network types. In total, there are four network types. There's broadcast, like when the routers are connected to a switch. There's point to point, when two routers directly connect to each other. There's also point to multipoint and non-broadcast multi-access or NBMA. For a CCNA exam level, we're only gonna be worried about the first two, broadcast and point to point. So you can ignore the other two for this series. Point to point is the simplest one to understand. One router directly connects to another. This is more common with a WAN connection, that is a connection from one site to another. When one router sends a message, there's only one other router that could possibly receive it. This is a nice and uncomplicated model. On the downside, we can't add more routers to the network. We can only create more networks and add routers there. The most common network protocol would have to be Ethernet. One key feature of Ethernet is that it uses broadcasts. When an OSPF router connects with an Ethernet interface, it will be on a broadcast network. This includes connecting a router to a VLAN on a switch. The key points for an Ethernet network are, there can be more than one device on the network. When a router sends a message, other devices may see it, and it scales well, as it's easy to add more routers. There can be other devices on the same VLAN, not only routers. So how does a router know which of these devices are OSPF routers? It would be fair to think that the router would send a broadcast message to everything. It is a broadcast network after all. That's not right though. OSPF doesn't actually use broadcast messages. It uses multicast. This enables OSPF to send a hello message to 224.005, which is OSPF's special multicast address. Other OSPF routers will listen for messages sent on this address. When they receive the hello message, they're able to respond to the sender. Let's think about a problem that could occur on a broadcast network. We'll then see how OSPF solves this. When a router adds a new network, it floods an LSA to its neighbors. This is how it advertises this network. The neighbors would then request more information with an LSR message. Once they learn the new route, they would tell their neighbors and so on. That's a lot of messages flying back and forth. Imagine how bad it would be if there were 20 or 30 routers here. This many messages has the potential to impact the performance of the network. But OSPF is smarter than that. For every broadcast network, OSPF will elect one router to be the designated router, or DR. It will also elect one backup designated router, or BDR. All other routers are called DR others. Each OSPF router has a priority which is set to one by default. Of course, we can change the priority if we want to. The router with the highest priority becomes the DR, and the next highest is the BDR. If some routers have the same priority, like they do by default, the highest router ID breaks the tie. If a DR fails, the BDR is promoted. Then one of the DR others will be promoted to BDR. How does that solve the problem? Well, when a router adds a new network and it sends out the LSAs, they aren't sent to every neighbor. Instead, they're only sent to the DR and BDR. This uses multicast address 224006, which only the DR and BDRs listen to. They will then use an LSR to request more information as normal. The DR will then distribute this information out to other routers, that's the DR others, on the network. This cuts down the number of OSPF messages on a broadcast network. It's easy to see what roles our neighbors have. On a router, we can look at the neighbors with show IP OSPF neighbor. This is a topology with five routers, so we will see four neighbors. In the state column, we can see that one of the routers is DR, one is BDR, 
and the other two are DR other. That makes this router a DR other as well. What if we want to make this router the DR? To do this, we enter configuration mode and then interface configuration mode. Remember that a DR and BDR are elected for each broadcast segment. That means that these settings can vary per interface. For example, our router could be DR other on this network and BDR on some other network. We need to change the priority to influence the election. The command is IP OSPF priority. The default priority is 1. We'll set this router to 100. We could also set the priority to 0. This would mean that the router would never become a DR or BDR. If we take a look at our neighbors again, we will see that nothing has changed. So what's wrong? Nothing. It may be surprising to hear that this is actually what's supposed to happen. Let me explain. OSPF elections are not preemptive. That means that changing the priority does not trigger an election. So adding a router with a better priority will not immediately change the DR and BDR. This means we need to force an election. We can do this by clearing the OSPF process. But we don't do it on the router we just configured. That won't trigger an election. Instead, we need to do this on the current DR and BDR routers. Let's head over to R5, which is the current designated router. Here, we'll clear the OSPF process, which causes the neighbors to drop and reform. Back on R1, we can look at the neighbors again. We see that the router R5, that's 192.168.10.5, is now a DR other. Router R4 has been promoted from BDR to DR. So even though there's an election process, R1 hasn't become the DR. When the designated router drops out, the BDR gets a promotion. The routers hold an election to select the new BDR. You'll notice that there's no BDR in the list here. That's because R1, the router we're logged into, is now the BDR. For R1 to become the DR now, we would need to restart the OSPF process on R4. Let's take a step back and think about this simple topology. What type of OSPF network is this? You might assume that it's point to point, but that's not necessarily true. These two routers could connect to a switch and be in the same VLAN. That would be an ethernet connection and therefore a broadcast network. Or they could be directly connected together. But the interface type might still use Ethernet. That would still be a broadcast network as far as OSPF is concerned. Even though there are only two routers, they would still need to elect a DR and BDR and handle LSUs in the manner we've been discussing. Of course, that's not very efficient. So if we want to, we can change the OSPF network type. Let's go back to R1 and see how that's done. From before, we can see that there are a few routers here. This is not a very good topology to change the network type as there are five routers in the segment, but I want to show you how to make the change as well as what happens if you use the wrong network type. Once again, we configure this under the interface. We use the IP OSPF network command. And here we can see the network types we can choose. We'll set this interface to point to point Straight away, the neighbors drop. The key point here is that neighbors need to have the same network type. Let's look at the R5 router. The logs on the screen show us that the neighbor adjacency with R1 repeatedly forms and drops. We can change the network type on this router too. It's the same command as before. Immediately, the other neighbors fail. They keep trying to reconnect but they'll never be successful as long as the network types don't match. We'll take a look at a better example of changing the network type when we get to the lab at the end of the video. Before we move on, here's a little review to help with designated routers and backup designated routers. 